Welcome. Well, another week has come and gone, and once again, we welcome you to Williamsburg Baptist Church's virtual service. We are most happy that you are joining us and hope that our service will leave you spiritually and ready for another week. Don't forget the socially distanced trunk or treat Saturday the 24th in our church parking lot from 4 to 6 p.m. for the community. We have had an overwhelming response to our event on Facebook, and nearly 200 families have responded. Volunteers are still needed to either pass out candy from your trunk or help Deb with running the event. You can find more information by visiting our Facebook page Together, we can make this a successful event and bring a smile to the children in the community. A reminder for our WBC members that the quarterly business meeting is planned for this Sunday, October 25th at 11 a.m. You should have received an email, postal letter, or phone call with more information regarding the how and where. Now let us turn our thoughts and mind to hear the call to worship. The Lord is King, let the peoples tremble. God sits on the throne, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, God is exalted above the people. Let them praise God's great and awesome name. God is a lover of justice and has established equity. God executes justice and righteousness among God's people. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at God's footstool. Let us praise and worship our God. Thank you. 
Good morning, my friends. It's that time, time for this week's children's sermon. Please gather around your computer or streaming device for this week's Talk with Children. Hello. Hi. Hey. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. How are you doing at home? I don't know if you children know it or not, but in a couple of weeks, it'll be election day. If you watch TV, I bet you've seen at least one ad telling you why you should vote for one person instead of another. One of these things that they bring up in a lot of these ads telling you you should vote for are taxes. Have you ever heard your parents or another adult complaining about having to pay taxes? Not really. Well, some of you probably have because most people are not too fond of having to pay taxes. Do any of you pay taxes? I do, not too much. Well, it might surprise you to learn that kids pay taxes too. Did you ever receive an allowance from your parents or money for doing chores around the house? I remember seeing one of you in a Zoom call not too long ago and you were showing us all the money that you got for your eighth birthday. I know my kids love it when they get money and gift cards for their birthday, and then they can go buy something they want with their very own money. Have you ever bought anything with your own money? If you've ever used your own money to buy something, you've probably paid some taxes. Did you know that every time you buy something, you pay a sales tax? In Williamsburg, there's a tax of a little more than seven cents for every dollar you spend, unless you're buying food, and then it varies. I wonder what Jesus would say if we asked him whether kids should pay taxes. Hmm, that's a tough question, and it's also a loaded question. A loaded question is a question that is worded so that no matter how a person answers it, it would make them look wrong and make people get mad at them. Hmm. If Jesus answered, yes, kids should pay taxes, all the kids would get really mad at him. And if he answered, no, kids shouldn't pay taxes. The people who make our laws would probably get mad at him because the state and our schools need that money to operate. It seems that someone would get mad at him no matter which way he answered. It's a no-win situation, isn't it? Did you know that something like that actually happened? In Jesus's day, the people were required to pay something called a poll tax. This poll tax was a hated tax because it was used to pay for the Roman army that occupied their land and ruled over them. No wonder people hated that tax. One day, some religious leaders came to Jesus and they asked him, do you think people should pay the poll tax? They were trying to trick Jesus with this loaded question because they knew if he said, yes, they should pay the tax the people would be very angry. But if he said, no, people shouldn't pay the poll tax, he would get into a lot of trouble with the authorities and could even be put in jail. Jesus saw right through their plan and he did a very wise thing. He asked them for a coin. Then he said, whose picture's on this coin? They answered, it's Caesar. Caesar was the Roman ruler and all the taxes had to be paid to him. Jesus then said to them, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Hmm. I brought a $5 bill with me today. Whose picture's on it? Abraham Lincoln. That's right. It's a picture of Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. What does it say right here next to his picture? The United States of America. That's right. It says the United States of America. Well, I guess that means that this $5 bill belongs to Abraham Lincoln and the United States of America. But what about God? Jesus also said, give to God what belongs to God. The Bible says that we were all created by God and that we're created in the image of God. Since we're all created by God in God's image, we should try to live our lives so that we reflect the light of Jesus to the world. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to be a light to the world and to show your love to those around us. Please help us to be kind to one another and to take the time to show each other kindness. Help us not to turn away when we see someone struggling, but instead stop to lend a helping hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We want to thank each of you for joining us this week, and we hope that until next week, you stay healthy and happy. Until next time, bye. 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 Have a good day. See you next time. As we move into a time of prayer this morning, I'd like to take to encourage you to take a few moments to reflect on the people and things that you would like to carry with you into prayer this morning. And if you get our weekly prayer list via email from the church office, I'd certainly encourage you to take a few minutes later today or later this week to spend some time reading through those names and praying for members of our congregation. The, the prayer that I will pray this morning is adapted from a prayer that I found this past week uh, by a pastor named Nadia Boltz Weber, who is the pastor of a church called the House for All Sinners and Saints in Denver, Colorado. And as we begin our time of prayer, I will begin with a brief moment of silence to help us to open our hearts to God and to offer silent prayers to God. So let us pray. God of all things, we made it through another week, despite the fact that seven days ago, we didn't have any clue how we would make it. So thank you. God, we confess that we have some pretty big fears about the future right now. I mean, some really catastrophic notions about what might happen in our country, in our communities, and in the world. So if we could ask this one thing, God, please remind us of the goodness of this moment. That this moment right now, the one where the light has just broken the line between ground and sky, where perhaps all we can hear is the quietness of this moment, or the kids watching television in the other room, or the clicking of some cheap wall clock from Target. Whether we sit in our Sunday finest or still in our PJs, God, remember this moment right now is the only thing that is real. So God, we pray that you will ground us in this moment. Convince us of the fact that there is nothing we can do now about the past and that all the days to come will never be quite as real as this present moment that we're in because the fears that we have are starting to feel like a monster from the future that shows up each day and steals the joy, the peace, and the pleasure of the present moment. And God, more than ever, we need joy and peace and goodness right now. God, if indeed perfect love casts out fear, then remind us that you already loved us that you already love us in the days to come, just as you always have, from the day to our, of our birth to the day of our death. This is the day that you have made, this day. Help us rejoice and be glad in it. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We come to our time of offering. If you wish to contribute and support the work and mission of WBC, you may do so either by mail or by going to the church website at www.williamsburgbaptist.com and selecting Give from the menu. Let us pray. God of power and glory, 
we come to your altar this morning, offering our gifts and praying for your presence in a world that is hurting and divided. Much of what we see is chaos, confusion, and anxiety, a world that desperately needs to glimpse your presence and your glory. More than just our gifts of money, we pray our lives might be a window into your love and compassion. We pray your light might shine through us to the world. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. So I wonder if you'll take a moment to turn to Matthew 22 with me. This week's reading follows directly on the heels of last week's passage. The passage last week raised issues related to power and sovereignty. And I suggested in my sermon that God is fundamentally a different sort of ruler than the kings of this world, or the presidents of this world, if you will. This week, yet again, issues of sovereignty and allegiance continue to be front and center. So we pick up reading in Matthew 22 with verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the used for the tax. 
and they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I don't know if you've heard or not, or maybe you've seen some advertisements on television or heard them on the radio. Apparently there's a big election coming up in just a couple of weeks, right? I hope that's not news to anyone. Now, <laughs> I have decided who I am voting for, but I understand that some people are still trying to make up their minds. Uh, but I gotta be honest, I can't wait for the political ads to be over with. I was, I was sitting down playing a video game with my son Julian yesterday, and we were watching a YouTube video trying to figure out how to beat this level that he, he couldn't beat. And every four or five minutes in the middle, middle of this video game, YouTube video, a political ad kept popping up, and my son Julian was not impressed. The candidate did not earn any new votes from us. It is interesting, isn't it, the timing of today's scripture passage? It is a lectionary text, and it pops up here in the cycle of readings about two weeks before the election, of all places. It is a text that speaks to us in this present moment in rather remarkable ways. What is our obligation as citizens of our country, while also acknowledging that we are citizens of God's kingdom? If you've been following our worship for some time, you know that we have been making our way through Matthew's gospel, and Jesus has come repeatedly into conflict with religious and political authorities. So it's little surprise today when representatives of the Pharisees and the Herodians approach him with a test. Now, just a, a brief word about the big picture. In, in Judea, during Jesus's life, all of the Jewish people were under Roman occupation. The Roman Empire had conquered much of the known world. They were truly the one great superpower of the world in the first century. The Jewish people had enjoyed a brief period of freedom and independence before Jesus's life, but Rome began occupying Judea in 63 BCE. They installed client kings to rule on their behalf, to collect taxes, and to put down any potential rebellions. Some of you all will know that the most famous of these kings was Herod the Great. He ruled for decades and he ruled violently. After his death, his territory was divided up among his sons, who continued ruling the Jewish people on behalf of the Romans. So the Herodians in today's text are members of the wealthy upper class of people who support the legitimacy of the Herodian dynasty and also Roman rule. They are staunchly pro-Roman, if you will, because it serves their own personal interests. The Pharisees, on the other hand, are primarily Jewish religious figures, and they have a much more tensive and ambivalent relationship with their Roman overlords. All that to say the Herodians and the Pharisees are not natural friends. And yet, in spite of their differences of opinion, these two groups conspire together today to try to trap Jesus in his words. We might imagine them thinking, after all, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they pose this question to Jesus. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And as you can imagine, this is a loaded question. There's no way that he can possibly answer this question in a way that will satisfy both groups. It is a an attempted entrapment, plain and simple. If Jesus says, yes, it's lawful for us good Jews to pay taxes to Rome, then it will appear as if he supports Roman occupation of Israel and the ongoing oppression 
that so many of his followers face. It could turn some of his followers against him. If he says, no, we shouldn't be paying taxes to Rome, then he will be labeled a revolutionary and may invite a violent response. Notice that the question that they ask is inviting a yes or no answer. It reflects the same sort of either or thinking that we're so familiar with today. They view Roman taxation as a black or white issue. Either you're with us or you're against us. They are one issue voters and you're either on their side or you aren't. Sound familiar? In our own polarized society, it is routine to fixate on one political issue and draw some pretty firm lines in the sand. You know, and pick an issue, there are plenty in the news today. Abortion, mask wearing, gun rights, health care. And you know, if you tell me where you stand on one of those issues, I'm probably going to begin to make some assumptions about where you line up on all the others as well. Jesus recognizes the predicament he's in with their question and their malicious intent behind it. So he says in response, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And so they bring him a denarius, and the denarius is a type of coin that Jewish persons would have used to pay this particular tax. And it's noteworthy, I think, in and of itself, to realize that Jesus doesn't seem to have a denarius on him. And I want to be careful about not reading too much into that fact, but I do think it's worth noting he himself doesn't have a coin that they were preparing to pay taxes with to Rome. Now, this coin that they show him has a graven image of the Roman emperor on it. It's, in fact, Emperor Tiberius, who was the emperor during Jesus's life. And the coin also would have had an inscription on it that read, Son of the Divine Augustus. In Jewish understanding of the time, this coin would have been considered idolatrous, plain and simple, simply because of the fact, one, that it had an image of a person on it, but two, because of the emperor's claim to divinity. The fact that they're able to offer him one reveals their own hypocrisy in acknowledging the divine claims of Caesar over and against what should have been their monotheistic faith in God. In spite of their hypocrisy, he offers them this answer to their question. Give, therefore, to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And that's it. Verse 22 says they were amazed at this response, and then they went away. It is a clever and provocative response from Jesus, and it says an awful lot in spite of the few words that he uses. And yet I can't help but wonder, as perhaps you do as well, what in the world does Jesus mean by it? Part of the beauty of the response to them is that it is intentionally ambiguous and vague. Both the Herodians and the Pharisees can hear what they want to hear in his words, and neither can say, aha, we've got you now, right? But for all of us who hear, these words beg us to ask ourselves this question. Well, what really does belong to the emperor? And what belongs to God? On the one hand, the Roman emperor claimed to control and rule the entire world. And Roman propaganda would have suggested that everything belonged to the emperor. And on the other hand, People of faith believe that God created the world, and thus we might be tempted to think that, in fact, everything belongs to God. All too often, this verse has been interpreted as suggesting that we should simply submit entirely to the will of the ruling authorities and politicians, but it doesn't really say that. It creates a much more tensive situation. It leaves open the possibility of paying taxes, 
while also provoking hearers to question the ultimate authority and sovereignty of the emperor. Jesus, for his part, after all, probably did not want to encourage his followers to openly defy the emperor and jeopardize their lives. He recognized that recognizes that if he travels around the countryside saying that Jewish people shouldn't pay taxes to Rome, then Rome is going to send its legions and, and swiftly and violently end what they view as an insurrection. The resistance that Jesus incites is much more subtle than open rebellion. It begs his followers to grapple with the complexity of faith and com conflicted political loyalties. The, real the realities, the political realities that Jesus' followers must navigate are not black and white. It may be that they end up paying taxes to Rome out of obligation and safety, while also simultaneously offering God their time and money and gifts because of their sense of calling and their ultimate commitment to God's kingdom. It may be that they pay lip service to the emperor by paying taxes, but then they worship and honor God alone. It's not an either-or situation. I must confess, and my hunch is that many of you feel this way as well, I feel like I have a complicated relationship right now with our country, with the United States. On the one hand, I am so grateful to live in America and grateful for so many, of the, so many of the advantages and privileges I enjoy as a citizen of this country. My wife and I are grateful for public schools, safe neighborhoods, and access to the health care that we can get. And yet we acknowledge that our country is far from perfect. We recognize that we enjoy certain advantages simply because we are white and middle class. We know that our country has an outsized influence on other countries because of our financial and military leverage that we bring to bear on them. We understand that more people go to bed hungry every night in this country than we can even begin to imagine. It's okay to have a complicated relationship to this country in which we hold our citizenship. And this is not a new thing, to be clear. It's not simply because Donald Trump is president or Barack Obama before him. Loving and respecting our country does not mean accepting uncritically that the United States is great or perfect. Rather, our love of country should invite our critical and creative engagement in making it better for all people. My hunch is that as followers of Christ, we will inevitably feel like we have divided loyalties in this world. After all, as scripture suggests, we are not only citizens of our country of origin, but we are also citizens of heaven. Just as the question of Roman taxation was a complicated one for Jesus' followers in the first century, our lives as Christians in the United States will always be marked by ambivalence and tension. We can pay taxes and yet at the same time find ways to resist what we see as gross injustices perpetrated by our country. We can serve in the army and yet advocate for peacemaking. We can choose to say the Pledge of Allegiance as long as we remember that our ultimate allegiance belongs to God alone. It's okay to vote even if we don't fully agree with everything a candidate says. It's okay to acknowledge the tension and acknowledge that we find ourselves in a complicated situation. Jesus' response to the Pharisees and Herodians today is an invitation to consider what it means to be people of faith in a world that is filled with political parties and powers that desperately want us to pledge our allegiance to them above all others. On November 3rd, or sooner, you can and should vote, as long as we don't put the entirety of our faith in one politician, hoping that they will save us from all that ails the world. 
And then once you vote, get back to the work of building God's kingdom here on earth. God continues to call us to roll up our sleeves and find ways to love and care for others and for our neighbors. We can be good citizens of our country as long as we remember that our ultimate allegiance is to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, hear these words of benediction. Go in peace, and as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed, and we are being redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace.